This video is dedicated to one artifact alone, an ancient Egyptian papyrus called the Papyrus of Ani, the longest of its kind. It's what is known as a Book of the Dead, a series of prayers for the deceased spirit to repeat in order to gain access to the floodplains of the afterlife. In the Old Kingdom, such prayers were written on royal tomb walls and hence are known as pyramid texts. In the Middle Kingdom, non-royals had prayers on their coffins, hence the name coffin texts, and in the New Kingdom, these prayers were written on papyri. Although the acquisition of some of the artefacts in the British Museum, such as the so-called Elgin marbles, are the subject of some polemic regarding their acquisition, there is no ambiguity about the papyrus of Ani. It was stolen by Budge from an Egyptian government storeroom in 1888, when Egypt was part of the British Empire. As is usual in Egyptian books of the dead, the Book of Spells begins with a hymn to the sun god Ra, as it is his martet boat and sectet boat that will transport the soul of the dead across the sky in the morning and afternoon, respectively, to reach the afterlife in the west. However, an unusual and dramatic feature of the papyrus is that it starts with the most important scene of the progress of the soul to the afterlife, the judgment scene. The video Art of the Ancient World summarizes some of the most important Egyptian deities, some of which are mentioned in this, the hymn to Ra, which I'll read aloud. But just to recap, Nut is the goddess of the night sky, Horus is the son of Osiris who brought his father back from the dead, Thoth is the scribe of the gods and plays an important part in the recording of the judgment scene. Maat, Ra's daughter, is the goddess of truth and order. This is the text. Homage to you who has come as Kepera, the creator of the gods. You rise, you shine, you make light in thy mother, the goddess Nut. You are crowned king of the gods. Adore him in his beautiful form at his rising in the Artet boat. May I see Horus acting as steersman with the god Thoth and the goddess Mat, one on each side of him. May I grasp the bows of the Sektet boat. May there be made ready for me a seat in the boat. This is the judgment scene itself, and we'll explore each of the outline sections in more detail. On the left hand side of the picture, we see Ani and his wife Tutu entering into the presence of Anubis and Thoth. Tutu is carrying a sistrum. It's a metal ring holding movable rods and rings of metal, which was used as a shaker to make sounds in religious ceremonies. She's also wearing the minat, a necklace and pectoral associated with religious ceremonies. Both items are associated with Hathor, the female cow god. And his prayer is addressed to his heart, which for the ancient Egyptians contained the eternal soul, the Ka, which is mentioned at the end of the prayer. I'll read it aloud. And for us as modern readers, I think we get a sense of the feeling of the text if we bear in mind that essentially Ani is pleading for immortality. He's begging not to die. This is the text. My heart, my mother. My heart my mother, my heart whereby I came into being. May nothing oppose me at my judgment. May there be no opposition to me in the presence of the gods. May there be no parting you from me. In the presence of him that keepeth the balance, you are my car which lives in my body. Anubis is responsible for correctly weighing Ani's heart, which contains his soul represented as a bar bird above it. If the figure of fate on the left makes it weigh exactly the same as the feather of Mat, he will pass into the afterlife. There were in fact nine aspects of the soul in Egyptian theology. Uh, the cat, the ka, the bar, the ab, the kabit, the ku, the sechem, the ren, and the sahu. The last of these, the sahu, was the immaterial body which took the same form as the physical body and ascended to heaven to dwell with the gods there. Hence the need to preserve the body through mummification. 
especially the heart, which was put into a separate canopic jar, which we'll see later. If the scales do not balance, the monster Amit, with the head of an alligator, the body of a leopard, and the legs of a hippopotamus, will eat the heart of Ani, destroying his soul forever. Thoth here records the verdict aloud. Above these scenes is the gallery of the gods, who witness the judgment. Horus now presents Ani to his father Osiris, who is referred to as Wenninifer, the one who continues to be perfect. As Ani's heart has been found true, he gets beer and cake, which is nice. The image of Osiris is for me absolutely stunning and a work of art in its own right. Similarly, of these two following images, the image on the left, a picture of mourning the death of Ani, is an image which communicates its feeling as powerfully as any Renaissance lamentation of Christ. The image on the right depicts the opening of the mouth with a ceremonial axe, which was important for the deceased to be able to speak in the afterlife. However, this is not very clearly depicted in the papyrus of Ani. This example is taken from a different papyrus. There are also other spells to protect the body against harm, uh, such as damage to the body by weevils. These two images on this page are another prayer to the sun god Ra. This time in the form of the god Kepera, and the prayer is in order to ensure the perfection of the Ku, or spiritual soul, which was contained by the spiritual body, uh, or Sahu. And the prayer is described in some papyri as being associated with the soul's embarkation in the boat. And it is a beautiful representation of the boat, again, a work of art, which encapsulates the simple perfection of line and colour in Egyptian art. This section of the papyrus is interesting as it contains a small image halfway down the left side of the process of mummification being carried out by Anubis, which is the way in which the original Osiris was brought back to life after being murdered by his brother, the monster Seth. Uh, Osiris's son, Horus, sought out Anubis and asked him to carry out the process. The canopic jars to preserve the most important organs can be seen under the table. The last scene shows the arrival of the soul in the marshlands to the west, and again it shows the dependence of Egyptian theology on the material facts of the river, the Nile, which sustained life. 